Wall Street is a big money machine, and it's about making money for Wall Street. Uh, during the dot-com era, we were buying lots of Amazon, and the firm, uh, the firm I was working for was shorting it heavily. We had a big group, so we were trading like, we had 12,000, we'd make 12,000 trades a month. Funniest part of being in the New York Stock Exchange these days during an IPO offering, yeah. Out, when you bring your company public, you can invite me and we can go on the floor. Yeah, we'll do, yeah. Bing, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. get the bell going. In front, they do all kinds of crazy stuff, like where every time a company goes public, like the other day, and I... Hey everyone, Ben here, and welcome to Motivation to Invest. Today, we're joined by a Wall Street veteran, James Foytland, who actually ran his own trading group back in the golden age of investing during the late 1980s. Now, in this video, James is going to share with us some of his vast experience and some investing tips. So to kick things off, James, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your background? Why did you get started investing? What was your motivation to invest? Ah, well, you know what? I watched some of your other videos and I'm afraid that I'm not going to tell you I went to MIT or Stanford or any of these other highbrow universities. I actually was a roadie for a punk rock band. Okay. Um, and I met some people uh, and some gentleman who was worked for, I think it was Brown Brothers Harriman, actually, who was a retired vice chairman said, you shouldn't go to college. You should just go work on Wall Street. You'll make lots of money. So I had always been been sort of fooled around with investing a lot when I was a kid. My grandfather was kind of a hobbyist investor. Uh, and then I ended up through him taking the Series 7 and had a bunch of false starts. My claim to fame, people always go, what did you do on Wall Street? I said, I got fired from every single building south of, from Wall Street down on the, in the financial <laughs> district. That's my claim to fame. I love that. So while you can come on and say they went to Harvard, I could say that I got fired from every building downtown. Yeah, that, were you very outspoken or what was, what was the reason for you getting fired from so many places? Wall Street is a big money machine and it's about making money for Wall Street. Um, and I always felt that, you know, for my priority was the clients. And I felt if the clients made money or they always felt like I was on their side trying to make money for them, that when we didn't make money, they wouldn't get so mad at me. And over time, that kind of worked out. They, a lot of clients stayed with me for a very long time. Um, but it did get you in trouble with a lot of firms. For example, uh, during the dot-com era, we were buying lots of Amazon. And the firm, uh, the firm I was working for was shorting it heavily. Uh, and I can't remember the name of the analyst, but he went on, uh, some guy went on TV and said, Amazon is a $400 stock. And the thing went to like, from like 27 to 600 in about, about three wow. days. And they were short this thing and we were loaded. We were, I mean, I was up to the eyeballs. Like I could barely, <laughs> you know, I was like, uh, I was up to the eyeballs with this thing. And we, you know, and after that, it just, you know, people wouldn't get in the elevator with you after that. They almost, they were like, oh, that wasn't really, you shouldn't have been doing that. I'm like, well, the client, I, I have a guy, guy who still lives in the Dominican Republic because of the money he made on that one trade. Wow, wow. So was that, was that just- was that, so that was way before the bubble actually popped, the dot-com bubble? Yeah, this is at the very beginning. This is when uh, Jim Clark rolled out something called Netscape. And yeah. the joke on Wall Street was, even an idiot like you can go on the internet. I'm one of these people, when you show me technology, I'm like, the value of that technology is if anybody can use it. Like, most people drive a car, but they don't know how it works. Most people use a cell phone or, or can figure out how to use one very easily, but they really don't know how it works, but they can use, that's a good technology. 100%, um, and, I agree with that, yeah. yeah. And so Netscape was just this elegant, like sort of simple software that allowed anybody to browse on the internet and it was revolutionary. And at the time I had played around with the internet prior to that on the Univax reader, believe it or not. <laughs> um, and it, it was just like, I was like, this is, this is what I've been waiting for. I like, this is going to totally change the world. And it was like, it, this is it. You know, you, you had that, yeah. like, usually you have these moments and, and often after the fact you go, wow, that was really important. I should have done this, or I should have recognized how, what a big deal that was. But this is one of those things that like the second it happened, I was like, bingo, here we are. The, the yeah. world has changed immediately. First web browser, democratize the whole internet. Everybody can access it. And then 
Still, didn't people think the internet was a bit of a joke back then? I, I oh, totally. The New York yeah. Times wrote a seven-page article on how stupid the internet was and how nobody was going to use it and uh, the, how highways were more important than the internet. Um, and it was really funny because later on, this same Jim Clark launched a company called Healthion. This is how bold the guy was. He had like 11 programmers and he said they're going to take over the whole healthcare industry in the United States, which is like 17% of the economy. Um, so he, he, they roll out this thing called Healthion, right? And um, one of the drug, big drug companies, I think it was, I don't, I'm not sure it was Pfizer. I don't know what the, I don't remember the exact drug company, but one of the big drug companies was like, well, the internet doesn't really have anything to do with our business. That's what they told him. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I was like, and, 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 and it was, it was, there were a lot of people, I would say were super skeptical well until 2000. Yeah. And uh, maybe even later than that. And the difference between the dot-com era and the current blockchain era mm, is during yeah. the dot-com era, you had a lot of guys running around like Jim Clark, who was 59 years old. He was an old guy already. Um, and he was like, this is going to make grandma's medicine cheaper. This is going to fix your car. This is going to make it easier to manage your finances. He was telling people what they were going to be able to do. And I, I, one of my, my pet peeves about this whole blockchain space is there's too many engineers running around patting themselves on the back going, my, my crypto does this and yours does that. And like, you know, like they're not really addressing like, what is it going to do for grandma? What is it going to do for that idiot who just got on the internet? Like, what yeah. is it going to, th that's what they need to do to really push this thing. I think the technology is fascinating, but like you said, the application, there is applications obviously in the financial space, but the internet, you could point to it and you could say, you'll be able to search for information online. You'll be able to shop online. You could do all these things that maybe the technology wasn't there yet, but this is what you could do. With crypto and blockchain, it feels more about the hustle and the trade of the actual asset than the actual yes. application. Yeah, you know. if you go back, you look at 2016, they put out this big report said blockchain was gonna impact real estate and this and that and all these things. And here we are in 2021 and, and, and in reality, none of those things have really happened. Mm. Um, they're there, the technology I think is there, but it just hasn't been implemented. And um, the internet had a much faster like takeoff rate. My main issue was it was hard to, it's hard to look at the, the token price and how does the underlying technology affect that token price? Like the token prices don't seem to have anything to do with the underlying tech. In some mm. cases, not in all, but in some cases. The second issue is you have a lot of what now they call altcoins, but old guys like me call them scam coins, coin and stuff that don't really do anything that are just sort of like poker chips where people get to trade for a while until they get mm. bored and then they move on to the next the next story and all they need is some guy like elon musk to go oh we're gonna <laughs> we're giving up dudes and we're doing whatever it is the new thing now the one with the dog sheba or whatever i don't know what the one is they're trading now um and it those those things i don't know if they really have any economic value it feels like people are investing into these assets because they want to make money not necessarily because that asset is gonna fix something and provide value i think warren buffett calls it the difference between wealth creation and wealth transfer. There's a lot of wealth transfer going on. So a, yes. lot, a lot of people are buying crypto and it will go up in price because of supply and demand. Yeah. If there isn't any wealth creation in the end, it'll be a bubble and it'll pop. And that's that's been a, a big issue with it. Yeah, George Gilder, who wrote the book called The Microcosm and all the people who read it in the late 80s like me, that's where we got the idea that the internet was coming. So we read that book and every day we got up, we looked under the bed, we looked out the window, we went in the backyard, we were looking for the internet. Where is it? And then finally it happened in 1994. Uh, he calls that hyperbolic finance where you're just, it's like trading just for trading sake. It doesn't, now the problem is though, some of the crypto and a lot of the blockchain actually does things like XRP actually does something. In reality, despite all the hype, it's really a small space when it comes, it's like 90% of the hype, but 2% of the entire financial picture of the world right now. I'm not, I don't even think it's 2%. It's, it's still smaller than the gold market. It's smaller than... Uh, a lot of other stuff. And, 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 and I'm not poo-pooing it. I'm just, there's a lot of issues that have to be taken care of with this. Uh, namely, if you want institutions to really buy it, you need real trading and you can't, 
you know, like right now we could make a coin ourselves and we could make a, say a billion tokens and you could get half a billion. I get a half a billion. And we go on all these websites and we open up hundreds of accounts under different names and we just trade with ourselves. And the two of us could make a hundred million trades a day with this fake coin that we make up. And then all of a sudden people are going to think it's highly traded. Now in the stock market, you couldn't do that. That's totally illegal. You know, that was stuff that was done in the 1920s. Yeah. <laughs> and so this is like, you know, there's, I have a tendency to agree a lot with the current chair of the SEC that they're, they're need, my, mind you, I'm very libertarian. So the problem is with the government is they generally, they regulate things. They have no, they don't understand anything about at all. And they create a lot of rules like, like after Enron collapsed, they created Surbanes-Oxley. And some people would argue that Surbanes-Oxley created the 2008 financial crisis. Mm. So, and I, I would say it's a pretty strong argument if you go through it. I think Other, strict, strict regulations coming on all crypto, you think, or just maybe Bitcoin? And I think they're going to, I think they're going, first of all, I think they have to create, you know, like a, like a buttonwood agreement, like trading. Like, like the original New York Stock Exchange was founded in 1792 by something called the Buttonwood Agreement. And not only did trader, traders got together with merchants and they said, this is how we're going to trade. And these are the rules. And we're going to, and we're not trading with anybody who doesn't sign on to that. And if you want to trade, you got to call one of us to trade. They, that's why that was created. Um, obviously that goes against a lot of the, the kind of decentralized finance that mm. uh, types that promote blockchain yeah. technology um but you need like if you want huge institutions to go and buy say bitcoin they need to know that the price they pay is the price it really is i mean if you look at a lot of those markets it's trades at different prices all over the place and i mean it's not the same on every exchange it's quite yeah. different meanwhile if you want to buy general electric general electric is the price no matter where you buy it in the world the only difference may be your currency that you're buying it mm. uh the other thing is is you need to separate the token trading from some of the big technology and and i don't know what that's going to mean maybe maybe those technology companies that actually are doing something like xrp need to actually be publicly traded stocks and our, and xrp is the technology that they promote kind of like Qualcomm owned CDMA, which was the basis for pretty much the whole entire cell phone system, really. It's, it's the underlying software that runs the cell phones. You can have a great technology, but doesn't necessarily mean it's a great investment. A lot of people that did invest even into the internet, which was a fantastic technology, late 90s, they all got burned in the dot-com bubble. Oh, we used to joke. We used to, like, I used, I used this thing called the Elliott Wave, and the Elliott Wave if you try to explain it to clients or you want to explain it to your compliance officer and wants to know why you're making uh, 8,700 trades a month and things like that. And this is like, you know, 96 and like we're, we're, we had a big group. So we were trading like we had 12,000, we'd make 12,000 trades a month. So I don't want to explain them Elliot wave. So what did I say? I said, listen, this is the way it works. If it's got a cool name and a cool symbol and nobody can figure out what the company does, we buy it. If it makes money, loses money, or anybody actually figures out what the company really does, we sell it. <laughs> and and I think blockchain needs that. What really concerns me is I think you have a generation, one, who doesn't see the danger of big government. They don't realize that the government could just arbitrarily make all this, just like they're doing in China. This stuff is all illegal. Sorry, you lost all your money. Too bad. Yeah, that's the benefit of experience. I think if you've been through multiple bubbles or even if you've read about them, it's happened many, many times, even with, with crypto. You hit on the perfect thing. Never ask a guy like me, what's the stock you made the most money on? You should ask, when you meet Warren Buffett, ask him, what's the stock you lost the most money on? He'll tell you all about it. He won't stop talking about it for three days. He'll, he probably has nightmares about it still. And like, that's how you, and if you study crises like the 2008 crisis, the 87 stock market crash, the 29 stock market crash, uh, the 1998 um, long-term capital sovereign debt crisis, whatever you want to call it, depending on who you are, you call it by different names. Uh, the Asian contagion in the early 90s, where you had a collapse in China and in, in Asia, which we may be seeing again, a very similar thing happen. Um when you study all these all these disasters and you study your own your own failures, like how what did I do wrong? And not beat yourself up and say, Oh, I made a mistake. I'm a, I'm terrible. I can't do this. You should say, What do I what did I learn by not selling or what it what was I blind to? And uh, I think then you you really start to learn to be a really good 
trader and you you start to because because for most people frankly if you just put money in an index fund and you put money away every month in the long run you'll make a lot more money than trying to be smart and fooling around with stocks the less you do the more money you're going to make 100 yeah yeah unless you're unless you're just you know you you know you hit a golden like that client of mine with the amazon um i bought a whole bunch of qualcomm in 93 and 94 it took off like a rocket and it, it just you know it was it was my it was you know the i'm gonna put that on my gravestone yeah so it's gonna people say what is gonna be on your ground of qualcomm qualcomm <laughs> it's just it's gonna say that it's gonna say qcom 1993 it's gonna just yeah. say that on my gravestone oh, yeah you, you learn more from the losses because of loss aversion so people feel the losses a lot more it embeds yes. into your soul when you get a loss yes. and then when you get a win it's like oh that was easy and, the and you think trade. you're smart and, and yeah. a lot of times a lot of times people get like i always say what what oh you want to trade okay are we in a bull market or a bear market well if we're in a bull market you buy stocks it's that simple because they go up <laughs> you don't have to be that smart and a lot of people i see now with some of these things they're going up and they're patting themselves on the back and they're all over tv and i made a billion dollars before i was 18 and all this stuff trust me half those people will not have a billion dollars in five years because it's always easy come, easy go. I don't want to tell you how many people I saw on Wall Street were showed up for work. Two days later, we're driving a Lamborghini. Three weeks later, we're being dragged out of there in handcuffs by the SEC. So it, oh. it, yeah, a lot of, yeah, all kinds of crazy stuff, stuff would happen or people would overextend themselves or I've always been kind of like an incrementalist, probably because I didn't go to Harvard and I didn't do those things. I And, and not that I, because people say, well, where do you know all this? I read like crazy. I read books like none. I, I read at least a book a month and I've done that probably since I'm 18 and I'm almost 60 now. So but they yeah. add up over a while. You get, you get, I, for most people, I want to tell you, if you read one book, you're smarter than 99% of the people in the entire world because they've never read a book. And, <laughs> and it's obvious when they talk or, you know, but it, it, if you read, if you and you read about people, like I just read a book about the founding of Netflix. I read, I read a book about a guy who, be, it's called The Accidental Investment Banker. He was working for a company and it got taken over and he became an investment banker because of that event. When you bring your company public, you can invite me and we can go on the floor. Yeah, we will do, yeah. Bing, 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 yeah, right. get the bell going. Right. Right. That, that's, that seems like the funniest part of being in the New York Stock Exchange these days, like the most activity yes. during an IPO offering, and yeah. out in front, they do all kinds of crazy stuff. Like where every time a company goes public, like the other day, and I can't even remember the name of the company, they were making a personal like aerial vehicle. So like sort of like a mini helicopter or, or it's kind of like a big drone that you could fly yourself. And they went public and I think the stock was around $9. And they had one outside in front of the stock exchange and they had they had, you know, they did like a big hoopla and rah rah, and they were giving away free food and hats that had the name of the company and things like that. And um, so it, it's kind of like a big promotional machine. Oh, great yeah. stuff, James. Um, yeah, that's been fantastic. If you have any comments for James, um, comment below. Um, that's today's video, guys. If you haven't subscribed yet, feel free by hitting that subscribe button, turning that notification bell on. With that being said, thank you so much for watching, and uh, I'll see you guys in our next video and invest safe. Thank you.